again, welcome to Stephalus Church. Uh, we have a chat feature on Zoom, of course, if you have uh, any uh, questions you want to ask, if you want to interact with us or anyone else on the Zoom, the chat feature is the way to do that. All right, got a couple of announcements tonight. First of all, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, it is uh, it is that time of year already. It just seems like we just had New Year's Eve, but here we are. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. And, you know, the truth is that um, regardless of whether you are married or single, uh, whether you're in a relationship, whether you are a widow, widower, whether you're divorced, whatever your situation is, um, you know, one of the things that we're celebrating every week is our love affair with God, with Jesus. And the truth is that uh, you are his Valentine every single day. So I hope you have a wonderful week and have a wonderful Valentine's Day. I want to remind everyone that there is a spiritual gifts assessment available on our website. Um, some of you have taken it. There are plenty of you who have not yet. It's free. Um, it's very insightful. Uh, if nothing else, it's going to spur some conversation. I would love to uh, to, to see uh, and answer any questions you have about that, but please don't forget to take your spiritual gifts assessment on our website, steeplelistchurch.com. All right, well, we are hoping that next week, keeping my fingers crossed, uh, will be our first test run for the Kimmel Home Group. We'll see how it goes. Um, obviously with, uh, today being Super Bowl Sunday and all of those things, it just didn't make sense for us to do that today. So hopefully next week we can run it live and see how it goes. And uh, we're excited, you know, uh, here we are in, in a church who promote home groups. We, uh, you know, we, we, we ask you guys every week, Hey, get a home group, get people coming to your place and then join us online. And we haven't been able to do that. So we're excited to be able to start that process ourselves uh, and have a new home group right here in Rockwall. All right. So no one eats until he is dead. That's the name of tonight's sermon. We're going to be in Acts chapter 23. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 11 through 35. So have your Bibles ready. I know you can't see him. Uh, but we are at my home right now, and John is going to pray for us. So, John, would you go ahead and pray us in tonight? Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for our lives, God. Thank you for all that you've done for us. God, I pray for tonight um, that uh, we, well, we thank you for the people that came to church. God, we thank you for everyone that will watch us later on. God, we pray that uh, the Holy Spirit will be moving and that um, everything that my Father says would be uh, in alignment with your Spirit, God, and your Word. God, we thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, before I even get started, I want to just real quick tell you that um, I had something very cool happen this week. There was one particular verse that uh, my take on it was maybe a little, not, uh, let me put it this way. There, the, the Theologians are divided over this one verse. Um, and I was kind of in the minority. Uh, so about 25% agree with me and about 75% disagree. Uh, and as I went through it, I reached out to my son and I said, hey, tell me what you think about this verse. I didn't tell him where I was coming from. And he came back and said, this is what I believe and this is why I believe it. And it just lined up perfect with, uh, with what I believe. So it was very cool um, to have that unification with my son, who is, of course, our associate pastor. So anyways, that was just sort of a cool thing that happened. All right, we're going to watch a quick video. Now, this is a, this is a clip from a film. Uh, you may recognize it. It's Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail. Now, let me be super clear. Uh, this is not a biblically accurate movie. In fact, I don't think there's one single true thing that's biblical in this whole movie. Uh, nonetheless, it's kind of fun. It's a fun movie. Um, in this scene we're going to watch, Indiana Jones has to pass some tests, and he's coming upon... Uh, the third of these insurmountable tests, that there's no way anybody can get past them. But he has this book, and inside this book, his 
his dad has accumulated all this knowledge over all these years on how to get past these tests. So he's got insider information. And we're going to see what that might have to do with this week's passage. So let's watch this quick video. The healing power of the grail is the only thing that can save your father now. It's time to ask yourself what you believe. So most of you probably remember that scene. Uh, it's especially close to my heart because the one thing I am really afraid of, I, I think, um, I mean, I think I could fight a lion. I hate heights. I am so scared of heights. Um, it's it's kind of my thing. So that scene really grabs me. But it'll be interesting to see what that has to do with tonight's message. So just kind of keep that in mind as we go through our scripture tonight. All right, I want to recap last week. If you remember, there was a Roman commander, and he had uh, arrested Paul to save his life. Uh, and then he really wants to know why in the world are the Jews trying to kill this guy? So the Apostle Paul um, is in custody of this Roman commander, and the Roman commander takes him before the Sanhedrin. That's the Jewish, kind of the high court, kind of think Supreme Court, if you would. And there was a group of leaders there, and they were a combination of Pharisees and Sadducees, if you remember the story. Um, and Paul starts to talk. He says something that uh, offends the, the high priest, Ananias. And Ananias has someone punch Paul in the mouth. You remember that from last week? Um, and subsequently, Paul pulls the pin on a spiritual flashbang grenade with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And he creates a conflict between those two groups. And things uh, completely get out of hand to the point where the commander, once again, this Roman commander, steps in pulls Paul out to save him. Now, the interesting thing is that at that point, 
things looked very bleak for Paul. First of all, he hasn't had any uh, success trying to evangelize uh, the first, the, the Jews in Jerusalem, second, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, those two, um, those two conversations have gone very, very badly. And Paul is in a dark place. And it's interesting uh, because scripture doesn't tell us quite why Paul's in a dark place or how dark a place he's in. But I think you'll agree when we start tonight's verses that Paul is in a, in a, in a tough place um, and God's going to show up for him. So let's look at Acts chapter 23, and we're going to start in verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem. So you must also testify in Rome. Now, I don't know if you caught that, but it said that God stood, Jesus stood near Paul. I want you to soak that in for a moment. Jesus showed up in Paul's jail cell. Now, Paul had been miraculously delivered from jail cells before. God had sent angels to help him. But this time, the Lord met him right in his jail cell. Can you imagine? And sometimes, you know, we, we often beg or even demand that Jesus deliver us out of our circumstances. You know, I could totally see Paul going, hey, God, can you get me out of jail? But sometimes that's not what God wants. God wants us to meet him right there in our circumstances. So that's the first part here is that God shows up literally to Paul. And then there's this interesting little phrase, take courage. Uh, that's the Greek word, tharse. Um, and it has three meanings, and it's not one or the other or the other. It means all three of these things at once. I am of good courage, good cheer, am bold. Okay, I'm of good courage, good cheer, and am bold. So depending on what translation you're looking at, whether it's King James or NASB, NIV, etc., you might see those three words um, interchanged. It might not say take courage. It might say be bold or be of good cheer. Now, think about it. Jesus wouldn't have said to be of good cheer unless Paul needed to hear those words, all right? Paul knew his situation was bad. Now, I don't know if you've read ahead or not, but if you have, Paul doesn't know the half of it. It is much worse, actually, than Paul realizes. It's about to get a whole bunch tougher for Paul. You might think things are bad for you right now. But you might not even know the half of it. Things might be about to get really bad. And yet... Jesus says to be of good cheer, to take courage, all right? Why? Why did he say it to Paul? Why does he say it to us? It's not because everything is fine, because clearly, as we're, we're about to find out for Paul, everything is not fine, okay? Um, it's because God is still on his throne. And he still holds to his promise that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. It's one of my favorite passages, Romans 8, 28. Look, anyone can be of good cheer when everything's great, right? It's easy to be 
cheerful, to be happy, to be courageous, when everything's going the way it's supposed to. But Christians, we can be of good cheer when everything is rotten, right? Knowing that God is mighty and wonderful no matter what the crisis at the moment is. So back to the passage, be of good cheer. It's, it's actually only one word, like I said, um, and it's used seven times in the New Testament, but a couple of those are repeats because they're in the Gospels, and it's, it's really only used five times, for at least in five different stories, and each time this word is used by Jesus himself, all right? So do you remember the story of the bedridden paralytic? Um, he, he was literally paralyzed. He was on a stretcher. Um, Jesus walks up to him and says, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. That's Matthew 9, 2. So here we have another use of this word. And it's this bedridden paralytic. Things are not good, right? This is, this, is not, this is not the circumstances we want to be in. And yet Jesus says, be of good cheer or be courageous. Now, I don't know if you remember the story of the woman with the issue of blood. In other words, she had a bleeding problem. And she had that problem for 12 years. And Jesus has shown up in her neighborhood um, and she's worked her way through the crowd, and she has literally reached out because she believes that if I could just touch Jesus' robe, that I would be healed. She has so much faith. Um, this pat this uh, story, by the way, is in Matthew 9, verse 22. And when she touches him, Jesus says, hey, who just touched me? Right? At the moment, things don't look good for her. And yet he turns around and he says, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Matthew 14, 27 uh, records a great story and another use of the same word. If you remember, Jesus is up on the mountain and he feeds the 5,000, right? Remember that story? Uh, it's one of the, the greatest stories in the New Testament. Uh, it's exciting. It's, it's encouraging. But at the end of the day, literally, Jesus is wiped out. He's exhausted, okay? And he says, hey, you guys get in the boat and you go across the, the, the Sea of Galilee. It's a, it's a big, giant lake. It's like, a, it's like a small ocean, but it's a lake, but it's a really long way across. And he says, you guys get in the boat and I'll meet you later. And, and you know the, 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 the uh, uh, um, the apostles have got to be going, meet us later. Like, how are you going to get there? But okay, Jesus, we're going to do what you say. And they go out and they get in the boat and a long time passes. In fact, um, Matthew records that the fourth watch of the night has taken place. And Jesus comes walking on the water. Remember that? Jesus literally walks up to their boat and they're freaking out. They think it's a ghost. They think they're seeing things. And what does Jesus say to them? He says this exact same word, be of good cheer. Take courage. Be bold. Okay? He says, it's I. Don't be afraid. And then the last time it's used was the night before Jesus' crucifixion. And he's having a conversation with his apostles again, and he's telling them, hey, I'm going to die soon. I'm going to have to leave this place. And he tells them that the Holy Spirit is coming, and he, and he kind of breaks down all of the difficult things that are ahead for them. And at the end of that passage, this is John 16, verse 33, he says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Imagine, they've been following Jesus for three years. He's about to leave them. He's about to die, and he tells them, take courage, be of good cheer. So this is, this is an important 
uh, concept for us to wrap our minds around. And that's what Jesus says to Paul in this jail cell. When he shows up, he says, be of good cheer. It's going to be okay, Paul. Be courageous. Be bold. All right. So what does he tell him? He says, hey, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, you need to do the same thing in Rome. Jesus is complimenting Paul on a job well done, and he adds, hey, you're going to need to do that again, and you're going to need to do it in Rome. You know, one of the things that is interesting about this is why did Jesus give Paul such a huge assignment? I think there's two reasons. One, he knew he could do it, and Jesus knew that Paul would do it. Okay, and I think that's the kicker. Do you realize that when God calls you to do something, he already knows you can do it. If he calls you to go talk to the person at the grocery store, he already knows you can do it. He already knows you have everything you need. If he says, take that mission trip to Haiti, he already knows you can do it. If he says, launch that church or start that home group, he already knows you can do it. So here is my first question tonight for you to consider. Is there anything that God has called you to do that you have not done? Because the greatest words a faithful child of God can hear are just like what Paul heard. Hey, there's more for you to do. And here's the deal. Here's what you need to know. If you're a Christian and you've got a pulse, you're still around, God has work for you. There are more people to bring to Christ. There are more ways for you to glorify him. There are more people to pray with. There are more disciples to make. There are more weary saints for you to encourage. On this specific subject, in this exact passage, Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite pastors and theologians, said this, a defined decree ordains for you greater and more trying service than as yet you have seen. A future awaits you, and no power on the earth or under the earth can rob you of it. Therefore, be of good cheer. You know, on a side note, Paul really wants to go to Rome. Acts 19.21 and Romans 1, 9 through 12 make that abundantly clear. Paul really wants to go to Rome. You know, sometimes we think that just because we want something a lot, that it couldn't be God's will for us. Have you ever been there? This is just me wanting it. It couldn't be God's will for me to do it. But I want you to listen to these two verses. The first one is Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We love that verse, don't we? We love the idea that he will give us the desires of our heart. Now, I want you to listen to another passage. This one's from John 14. And it's verses 12 through 15. And I want you to really listen to the very last sentence, okay? Truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know, we hear that verse all the time. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But we don't often hear the next sentence. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You see, this is where Christians experience power and purpose. When our heart's desires and Jesus' heart's desires meet, 
Remember, he didn't command you to drive a nice car, right? He commanded you to make disciples. So now look at how these verses line up for Paul. Jesus had a plan for Paul to get to Rome. And Paul was praying, God, please let me get to Rome. Paul's heart's desires and Jesus's heart's desires meet. And what happens? The Lord literally shows up in the jail cell, stands next to him, and tells him, you're going to Rome. Now, I just want to say one more time. Jesus showed up. Are you kidding me? The God who breathes out stars leaves heaven, comes to earth, and meets Paul in a jail cell. And he stands beside him to deliver some encouraging news. Now, just in case you haven't read ahead, you think Paul's going to make it to Rome? Think about the timing of this promise. It didn't look like Paul was going to get out of Jerusalem alive, much less, much less make it to Rome. God not only knows what we need to hear, he knows when we need to hear it. And when Paul faced his enemies the next day, and he would face them the next day, you know, scripture doesn't record this, this is just John, but I'll bet he had a sly little smile on his face. Because he knows that they're powerless against him because God has more for him to do. So hang on, Paul, you are going for a ride. All right. The next morning, some of the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about this case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. So a group of Jews have conspired to kill Paul. Who were these guys? Who were these Jews? Well, in the days of Paul and Jesus, there was a secretive group of Jewish assassins who targeted the Romans and their supporters called zealots. And this is probably who hatched the plot. They were a political movement. Uh, among the Jews who sought to overthrow the occupying Roman government. In fact, the historian uh, Josephus also wrote that they were closely aligned with the Pharisees, which would make sense in context with this and other stories. I want to give you an example. Listen to Mark 12, verses 13 through 17. I bet you've heard this story before, but I want you to listen to it now. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. They came and said to him, teacher, we know that you are truthful and do not care what anyone thinks, for you are not partial to anyone, but you teach the way of God in truth. Is it permissible to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Are we to pay or not pay? But he, and this is Jesus, but he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed. All right, again, most of us have heard this story, but have you ever wondered why? Why did the Pharisees ask Jesus that question? Of all the things they could have asked, why ask a question about paying taxes? Well, the reason is that 
Judas of Galilee, who was one of the founders of the Zealots, who we were just talking about, at this time is going around and calling the Jews cowards if they continue to pay taxes to Rome, All right? So these assassins are trying to stir people up, tell them, you're a coward if you do this. Suddenly, with some backstory, the passage has context and makes more sense. By the way, the, the zealots were also known as dagger men. They often concealed small daggers, uh, and they would literally uh, stab Roman soldiers as they walked by. So these zealots made a, a vow not to eat or drink until Paul was dead. That's a high level of commitment. Now, if something's tickling your memory right now, it may be the way one of the uh, disciples is described in scripture. Do you remember Simon, the zealot? What a curious choice for a disciple of Jesus. You know, most people single out Matthew uh, as the most unpopular choice Jesus made for a disciple because he was a tax collector. But what about Simon, the zealot? Now, not every zealot committed murder, probably, even if they didn't see it that way. Um, but he certainly would have been an advocate of the forceful overthrow of the Roman Empire. So could you imagine Simon, the zealot, turned disciple of Jesus, scratching his head as Jesus taught us to love our enemies? You know, the zealot's plan was to murder Paul, and that clearly is a sin. And these men who should have been committed to the law of God were instead happy to sin against him. And they were zealous, but they were willing to lie and sin to accomplish their supposedly godly goals. And the council, the Sanhedrin, they definitely knew this was wrong, right? They also, though, they were willing to put their own desires ahead of God's commands, put their own desires to kill Paul ahead of God's commands. Uh, but before we go judging them too harshly, I have a question for you to consider. Do you ever put your own desires ahead of God's commands? All right, something to think about. Continuing in verse 16, it gets interesting now. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. When Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander, he has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring you this young man uh, because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it you want to tell me? He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. All right, another unexpected character used by God, the son of Paul's sister. Okay, so a couple of questions. Did you know Paul even had a sister? And did you know she had a son? And by the way, how did he find out? How did this young man, how did he find out? Well, we, we don't know the answer to that question, but here's one thing we do know when it comes to sin. Your sin will find you out. Especially if you're a Christian, you're going to get caught, right? But here we have this Roman commander saving Paul again. You're going to see how he does it in just a moment. And remember, as we uh, kind of finish out this passage, why is he doing all of this? 
why is the commander protecting Paul? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, um, he needs to keep his area, his jurisdiction drama free, right? Because anything bad that happens on his watch is going to reflect, reflect badly on him. And Paul's in his custody now, right? So this is really about the self-interest of the commander. It's not like he's some great humanitarian. Uh, but let's keep reading. Starting in verse 23. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. All right. 470 warriors to move Paul in the middle of the night. Why so many? 470 warriors. 40 Jews versus 470 soldiers. The commander is expending a lot of resources to keep Paul safe. Did God want to exaggerate his faithfulness to Paul and show him, hey, beyond any doubt that his promise was true? Maybe. Or maybe the commander is just not taking any chances. So 470 trained Roman soldiers would escort Paul out of Jerusalem. And if you cut that, caught that last part, he even has them give Paul like a choice. Here's a whole bunch of horses. Pick the one you want to ride. Continuing in verse 25, he wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias to his excellency, Governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against them that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. All right, so the commander found no guilt. He's going to kick him up to the next level, okay? And in his letter, I don't know if you noticed this, but Claudius Lysias, the commander, he, he basically says, hey, I saved him because I found out he was a Roman citizen. He, he didn't say anything about the fact that uh, he, he bound him twice and almost scourged him to interrogate him. You know, he didn't mention that. But for Luke the man who wrote this book, the book of Acts, there's an important line in this letter, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. As we're about to find out, it takes a while for Paul to get to Rome. So long, in fact, that it's actually possible that Roman officials reviewed the book of Acts before Paul's trial with Caesar. So here, Luke is showing that other Roman officials have judged Paul not guilty. All right, let's finish the passage. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day, they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry uh, arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. All right. So the 200 soldiers went as far as Antipatris and then turned around. And that's because the most dangerous part of the road was up to that point. William Barclay, uh, who is a, a Scottish theologian, noted that that 25 miles uh, was very dangerous. But after that, the, the country uh, flattens out. Um, so it's, it's 
quite unsuited for any ambush, um, and it's mostly inhabited by Gentiles. So 200 of the 470 soldiers return, and the 270 continue on and take Paul to the governor. And when they get there, they hand over Paul and they hand over this letter. And learning that he was from Cilicia meant that Felix would in fact be responsible to hear and rule on this case. He was now, he, Paul, was now in the right jurisdiction. And the governor tells Paul, I will hear you, I will hear your case when your accusers have come. You think about it. Paul's list of important audiences is growing, right? We're now up to governor. This was the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise made to Paul 20 years earlier. You remember the story, Paul's on the road to Damascus. He's blinded when he meets Jesus, literally again, right? And he's, he's now blind, he's in Damascus, and God talks to this man named Ananias, and he tells Ananias to go talk to Paul. And after a little argument, like, hey, you know that Paul guy, or Saul then, that Saul guy, he's a bad dude. And God, talking to Ananias, says this in Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Well, for the last 20 years, he's been telling the good news to the Gentiles. He's had several run-ins with the sons of Israel, and now he's headed towards kings. Now, quick side note. Some of you might be wondering, hey, what about the guys who made a vow to fast until Paul was dead? right? Did they, did they die? What happened? Yeah, probably not. Uh, it turns out ancient rabbis uh, allowed for four types of vows to be broken, okay? This wasn't God's rules. This is the rabbi's rules, right? So if you had a vow of incitement, a vow of exaggeration, a vow made in error, or vows that yeah, cannot be fully uh, fulfilled because of some constraint, Basically, exclusions allowing for almost any contingency, they could be released from their vow. And that's all interesting, but how does this story relate to us? God wrote an incredible story for your life, and it's a perfect story but not from a worldly perspective, right? Your story is interwoven with pain and sorrow and difficulty and trials. But see, none of those things are designed to hurt you. They're designed to mature you. And your story also contains purpose and power, and miraculous transformations of the human heart. And from a godly perspective, your story is perfect. I want you to imagine a jigsaw puzzle, and this massive jigsaw puzzle is the entire story of mankind that, that God has designed. Your life is like a piece of that jigsaw puzzle. And it's so unique that only you can complete the puzzle. But you see, you have a choice. You can distort God's plan for your life and change the shape of your puzzle piece and it won't fit or you can embrace God's plan, knowing that he works all things for good for those who are called to his purpose. Let's pray for that. Father, thank you for creating us so uniquely that 
only we could fulfill the plan that you have for our life. Lord, I pray that we would be of good cheer, that we would be bold and that we would take courage, not because things are okay, not because there's no difficulty in front of us, to the contrary. We are bold and take courage and are a good cheer, Lord, because you are with us. And because you have a perfect plan for our lives. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so what? Now what? Are you living with good cheer? Are you being bold and courageous? Are you embracing God's story for your life or are you living your own story? Now, I'm going to tell you one more quick story tonight, and it's part of my story. Most of you don't know this, but I heard from God, wow, about 30 years ago that I was going to be a pastor. And I wanted nothing to do with that. I was in my 20s. I was going to pursue my career. Yeah, I was saved, but I had not committed to following Jesus the way I'm supposed to follow Jesus. And every time I'd get close to church and get going, that word of knowledge, if you would, would come up. You're going to be a pastor and it would scare me and I'd run away. And I'd run away for a while and then I'd come back and my wife was incredibly patient with me. And eventually, eventually I ended up on my knees and told God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. If you want me to be a pastor, I'll be a pastor. Now, a decade had passed from the time I heard it the first time to the time I told God I would go ahead and do it. And then he was like, Okay, first of all, John, relax. You are nowhere near ready to be a pastor. It turns out that was another two decades away. But I wonder, are you running away from something that God has in your path? Or have you been running away from God altogether? Is it time? Is it time to stop running and embrace the God who loves you? If that's where you are, please contact us through the website, text me, whatever it takes. Love to help you take those next steps and discover Jesus. All right, home group leaders, download the call to action questions now and answer those questions with your group. Today, we learned how God reassured Paul that he, God, was in control. And that Paul did not need to worry about his future. Well, it turns out that the Jews do follow Paul, and they are going to show up at the governor's palace. You want to know what happens next? You're going to have to show up next week. Thank you for being part of the Stevelist Church family. We love you, and we'll see you next week.